We dive into John 8 and have a little family chat about the tragedy that happened in Las Vegas. You know, 58 people were killed, hundreds of lives that will never be the same because of what they saw or because of the injuries that they experienced. Last I heard, there's still 104 people in the hospital and recovering. And this, this whole last 14 days has just been nothing but asking why. And even though the media continues to press the story deeper into the newscast and it's not the headlining story anymore, you'll see, still see some things pop to the surface where we're trying to understand why. What was his motive? I went out with my brother and my dad the other night after the men's barbecue and we're sitting there at the table. And even my own brother was just saying, Man, what's the motive? Like, why haven't we heard about the motive yet? And we want to know the motive. We want to know why would he do that? Why would, why would somebody open fire on, on just a good time, a concert? Why, why would that happen? Even before the tragedy, there was a group in California who asked a bunch of people, if you could ask God any question and you knew that he would answer your question, what would you ask? And the answer, the main question that they answered that survey with was we would ask him why. We would ask him why. Why for all sorts of things. Why the tragedies happen in our life. Why do we suffer? Why fires in California? Why hurricanes off the coast? Why shootings? And listen, as Coloradans, we, we are very familiar with this tragedy happening right around us. Remember, Columbine that happened in 99, it was a lot of the reason I got into ministry was because of the Columbine shooting and the other shooting just five years ago at the Aurora Theater. We're familiar with these kinds of sufferings, but we still ask the question, why? Why does this happen? And what's the answer for it? And I think that the Bible has already been clear. The Bible has already Uh, told us why these things happen. We may not know his specific motive of what he did 14 days ago, but we know why these things happen. There should be no question. And that is that evil is in the world. Evil is in the world. And so as a family, I just want to make sure that we're equipped to answer and to give a, a, a hope for a world that is plagued by evil. But evil exists in the world. Romans 5, chapter 12, the Apostle Paul made it very clear. He said, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. Why? Because death is part of sin. It's a consequence of sin. So death spread to everyone, for everyone has sinned. Evil is a part of the world. Sin is a part of the world. Because sin is a part of the world, therefore there are the consequences of evil. It's not the way God originally designed it. He never intended for his world to experience this kind of tragedy or these kinds of evils. That was not a part of his original design. In his original design, the world was flawless. It was sinless. It was without suffering. But by Adam and Eve's choice, evil entered the world. It marred God's design. None of this was out of God's control, by the way. But still within God's control... It was not exactly how God designed it or desired it. The Bible says that God is our refuge, that God is our strength, that he is our ever-present help. When? In times of trouble. We know that there will be times of trouble. Evil is in the world. We know that there will be times of trouble. It isn't if evil comes, if times of trouble come, but when times of trouble come, he is our refuge, he is our strength, he is our ever-present help. When? When these things come. Evil does and will continue to exist in the world. It was not created by God, but it was created by the sin of men. Greg Laurie is a pastor I trust, a pastor I've been able to meet, a great evangelist. And he wrote a letter last week in response to the shooting that happened in Vegas. And I want to just read a part of that letter. He said, remember that mankind was not created evil. This wasn't God's original design. But in their original state, Adam and Eve were innocent, ageless, immortal. But from the beginning, for the time that God gave life to Adam and Eve, man has had the ability to choose right and wrong. And man chose wrong, Adam and Eve sinned, and by sinning so defined the rest 
of humankind. By God's grace, we no longer have to stay under what is called the first Adam, the first of all mankind. We can now be under a new Adam who is the sinless one, Jesus Christ. It wasn't how God designed it, but evil does exist in the world. And our hope lies in the fact that there is a day when the Lord will bring his world back to its original design. There will be no more tears. There will be no more suffering. He'll wipe every tear away from our eye. But, but you can't help but look at the newscasts that have happened, and we know that there's going to be another shooting in the future. There's going to be another attack in the future. There's going to be another natural disaster in the future. You can't help but look at these newsreels and go, but do it now. Like, wipe our tears away now. Make the suffering end now. That's what I want. I want it now. Why, God? Why does this keep happening? And we get frustrated and we say, why aren't you doing something about this? Well, the Bible also answers that question. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, there's this beautiful verse that says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness. Because in our human mind, we think, well, you could act a lot faster, waiting for the end of time. That's... Seems like a long time. You're acting slow. And, and the Bible itself says the Lord's not slow to fulfill his promise, as some would count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. You see, God's acting in his perfect and patient timeline to reconcile the world exactly the way he sees it. Yes, there will be suffering. Yes, there will be sin. Yes, there will be natural disasters. I don't want another shooting any more than you do. I don't want World War III, as the news says, is about to happen any more than you do, right? But I know that there, was, there is a day when God promised he will reclaim everything. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. God promises that he will reign over all evil. And in the end, there will be no more suffering. But... Until then, we wait with expectant and repentant hearts. We look forward to that day when all of this is gone and no more suffering and no more scary newsreels. We have hope that lies within us that there is a day and we can say to the world that's distraught over this, listen, there's a day, I know it, my God promised it, it's coming. And we're expectant, but I do not want you to miss that key word, repentant hearts. Hearts that are constantly checking our Selves, saying, do I, do I battle with sin or do I make my home with sin? Am I living in the comfort of Christ or am I wandering out away from Christ? Listen, there is no peace outside of Jesus Christ. And if you're plagued by anxiety, I'm telling you, I know the one who calms anxiety. And if you do not know Jesus Christ, you will live in eternal panic attack. Because you do not know the one who calms all anxiety. Yes, we will still have anxiety and doubt and depression because we're humans and those things happen in this world. Even if you know Christ, you might be plagued by those things. But what I'm saying is for all of eternity, we have a hope in Jesus Christ that overcomes all of the tragedies that we see. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to invite you today that if you don't know Jesus Christ, you need to put your faith in him today. And I know some of you are saying, well, that's supposed to come at the end of the message, Pastor Josh. You do the call at the end of the message. Why? Let's do it now. I'm serious, friends. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you're just playing Christianity and you're playing church and you think that being around Christians and around church is the thing that's going to make you feel better about an evil world, I'm telling you, that's not even enough. You have to have a saving relationship with the very God who gave his one and only son to reconcile you in a way that you never could. You never can make yourself right with the world. Evil lies in your own heart. But you have a savior who comes and says, give me your old self. Give that to me. Stop it. And he puts on the cloth of righteousness over us and says, listen, I will set you free once and for all from the evil that exists in your own heart or in the world. But all you have to do is have faith. So if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the gospel is really simple. It's this simple. You are evil. Sin is a part of our nature. But we have a God who loved us so much that he sent his one and only son to die for us. And he died on the cross. And that's really cool and great, but that's not the end. He came back to life three days later. He overcame death. And that's cool, but that's only 
half the story. Just him coming back to life isn't the thing that's the coolest part of the gospel. The fact that he came back to life, that little miracle of being dead and alive, none of us can do that by ourselves, by the way, but only God can do that. And God did that to himself. He came back to life. And by coming back to life, that little miracle proved that he had power enough to forgive you of your sins. The resurrection is the very means that we can find life through the death of Christ. So if you don't know Jesus Christ, all you have to do is say, I put my faith in you to believe that you are enough for me, that you saved me, and I can have a right relationship with you, God, because of the price you paid. Let's just close our eyes and bow our heads now. And I'm just going to invite you that if you do not know Jesus Christ, that you simply pray a prayer of faith, expressing your faith to God. Simply say, Lord, I believe you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. And I believe he rose again on the third day to prove that I am forgiven. Help me live my days for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the power of salvation. We thank you that it is by the gospel of Jesus Christ any and every person in this room has the opportunity to have hope. And I thank you for those of us who have been able to, even if it was yet still this morning, for those of us who have been able to accept the truth of the gospel, that you have put within us the hope that is beyond all understanding. And I pray that you will help us be bold to a world that is dark and is evil. I pray that we will be a light shining, a shining light of hope that is ultimately the reflection of the life that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. As we encounter your word now, I pray that you will make it vivid in our minds. Bring us to a place where we understand you and know you better than we did when we entered this room. We give ourselves and our attention spans to you. We love you, the God who spans all time the God who has no beginning, the God who has no end. It's in your perfect son's name we pray, amen.